Welcome back to The Breakfast on PLOS TV Africa. Uh, we will be checking out the top stories making the rounds on our national dailies. And as usual, we do have our guests on standby who would make sense of all of this. Uh, and we have Ezekiel Nya Etuk, who is a public affairs analyst. Thank you, Mr. Ezekiel, for joining us this morning. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be with you. All right. Good morning. So I start off with the Daily uh, Sun newspaper this morning and uh, looking at the front page of the Daily Sun newspaper, the bold caption reads, hashtag NSAS, Lagos, or should please read riot act over planned protest. Lagos, or should please read riot act over planned protest. Uh, that's on page four. Uh, there's a writer saying, Delta to pay... 102 million naira compensation to victims. It's on page four of the Daily Sun newspaper. Now, looking at another story on the Daily Sun newspaper, you have tension in Southeast over Kano's trial tomorrow. Uh, it's on page six. Masop wants federal government and flays heavy military presence in region. All of that you find on page uh, four and six of the Daily Sun newspaper. 2023, Jaga predicts doom for APC and PDP, says parties will soon implode once again direct primaries. That's on page 26. And uh, just before we move away from the Daily Star newspaper, you also have Nigerian youths have right to demand better future. Uh, the governor of Lagos State is quoted on that on page 4. Outrage over Sokoto Market Massacre. It's on page 25. Anambra Abdusalami Peace Committee calls for peaceful polls. Nigeria spent 54 trillion naira on household consumption in six months. The National Bureau of Statistics is quoted on all of that. And HIV and AIDS are quite bomb. River State top charts in new cases. Details on page three. Well, that's the much we can take on the Daily Star newspaper this morning. All right, let's see what we can find on the Punch newspapers. It says there, NSA's anniversary, police occupy Lekki Toll Gate, others, activists set for protest. Protesters, security agents may clash as youths insist on commemorative rally. Organizers reject indoor anniversary to converge on the bridges, hold procession as uh, police deploy massive operatives in federal capital territories' uh, strategic locations. Also, Elrify hails troops, 50 bandits killed in air ground operations. Poultry farmers groan as soybean price jumps by 300%. Defense headquarters seeks nod to crush bandits with Tucano jets. Laments U.S. condition. And um, also on the Punch newspapers this morning, 264 million Nigerians and others undernourished, says the IMF. New amendment empowers INEC to use electronic voting machines, says Senate. And uh, strike alert NNPC to rehabilitate 16 roads with 621 billion naira. A few others on the punch this morning. APC, PDP exchange harsh words on FIAMI's three-year performance. Uh, PCN decries exodus of Nigerian pharmacists to Canada. And police threaten to punish inspector for voting at APC Congress. Two monarchs killed, others unconscious in Imo stakeholders meeting attack. And those are the stories on the punch this morning. All right, moving away from the Punch newspaper, let's check out the Daily Independent. And the bold caption reads, Buhari faces backlash over declining insecurity statement. Uh, that's the bold story on the Daily Independent this morning. The president is not in touch with reality. Pandef is quoted to say, and so you're going to have a, a back and forth with the replies. Nobody in his right mind will say insecurity has, re has reduced. It is politicization of state of insecurity in Nigeria. Uh, that's what lawyers are quoted to say. And Buhari yet to understand insecurity challenges, or Haneze is also quoted on that. This are riders you find on uh, the daily independent newspaper this morning. 2022 budget. Federal government to spend 71.6 billion naira on surveillance on Abuja Kaduna rail line. Others. Uh, Transport Ministry to spend 230 million naira on purchase of law books. All of the information you find on page 4 or 6 of the Daily Independent newspaper. APC Congress, Amechi Abe, renew rivalry 
as parallel ESCO emerges in rivers. Biosa government imposes docks to dawn curfew on waterways. That's on page three. Gunmen kill two monarchs in Imo State. That's also on page three. You find Kaduna makes COVID-19 vaccination compulsory for civil servants. It's also on page three. Youth have many reasons to ask for better life. The governor of Lagos State, Shongwo Olu, is quoted uh, talking about the hashtag NSAS protests. Well, that's so much we can take on the Daily Independent newspaper this morning. Now to the leadership newspapers. Despite 197 varsities, admission crisis persists in Nigeria. Only 500,000 candidates gain admission yearly. Three million miss out in three years. Expand facilities, as who tells federal government. And also, local government autonomy, 13 Niger councils can't pay salaries. Gunmen kill five in Imo, traditional rulers and um, abductor others. Katureras lament implementation of open grazing ban. We can also see national convention, cold war in APC over zoning. And finally, customers grown as 12 banks earn 120.5 billion naira from electronic charges. Uh, security forces kill 74 terrorists in Borno and Kaduna. Ezekiel talk. good morning once again. Um, I think you can begin with the biggest story that's made headlines, and that is the NSAS uh, memorial and the events for today. The Lagos State government, of course, the governor is quoted as saying that Nigerians have a right to demand you know, better governance and, and whatnot. But it doesn't seem to be... Uh, what it looks like at the toll gate this morning, and of course, seeing police presence, you know, in, in certain locations across the country. Quickly, share your thoughts. Um, the very first thing is that we have people. I, I can never say this enough. Who are in government without understanding what governance is. Governance is the people electing you to serve them. So what you do is you bend over backwards and do all you can to see how you can solve the problems of the people, interfacing with the people, seeing them as your employers and not as irritants. When you do that, a problem like that of the answers that was a major um, uh, uh, divide between the youths and the rest of us, is something that six months before the anniversary, you do not treat it as if it does not matter. You start to plan for it. You start to engage it. You seize the narrative. By so doing, you take the wind off the sail. But what do you do? Rather than see the youth as people that are the owners of the present state called Nigeria, because we in our 50s and 60s, not to talk of 70s, have had their, our time. When he said the youth are the leaders of tomorrow, I changed that and it went viral in the social media. The youth are not the leaders of tomorrow. Children are leaders of tomorrow. The youth are leaders of today, especially when we have redefined our own youth to go into 40s and even the 50s are trying to also see themselves as youth. I always say this, at 25, I was married. You call me leader of tomorrow. At 30, I had had my three children. You call me leader of tomorrow. At 37, I became the first Nigerian to get a facility for Shelter Africa for any state government in this country. You call me leader of tomorrow. At 50, my three children had graduated from the university. What are we talking about? We that are above 50 are sitting on the country of the young people. So we must realize that we are, we are tenants. They are the owners of the present Nigeria state. And the least we can do is to treat them as people who are the owners of the state as are today. So I had expected that if we had this mindset six months before today, there would have been conversations around, you know, issues about the youth, this happened, and as you are getting to you, before you even get to 20th of December, which is today, you would have completely, you know, kind of, in fact, the federal government would have had a major conversation around the future of the young people, a dialogue, and then 
When you do that, then the youths don't have any point to prove again. If anything, they will start to show appreciation because they feel that they are a part of the system. But we just have these people who believe in their 70s that they still own Nigeria. And I think it's sad. November 1, I'll be 58. I'm already, I'm already a grandfather. How then can I not see my children when I'm already seeing my grandchild? How can I still feel that the seat belongs to me? I mean, it, it is callous. It is irresponsible. Oh, it, is, it is the height of... of um, so, so I want you to, you know, um, share your views on, you know, the fact that, you know, one year later, there still doesn't seem to be a lot changed with regards to uh, the attitude of the Nigerian police. There still doesn't seem to be a lot changed or, you know, any justice really to those lives that were lost on this day. And, of course, in the month of October in 2020. Um, and, of course, the because judicial panel... Because in their mind, in their mind, the youths a year ago disturbed them. Think about it. It's a mindset thing. In their mind, the youths a year ago disturbed them. This, 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 this lazy youths, this recalcitrant youths, this unproductive, they call them all sorts of names, stigmatize them just to let them tell them, look, you don't have the space. That is why I keep saying this. The young people had to create another country for themselves that they call Niger. I say this all the time. The young people don't believe that they belong to Nigeria. And the old people don't think that Nigeria belongs to the youth. They want to sit on that chair until they drop. That is why you can have a man in his 80s being appointed as an ambassador. It's just a mindset that we really need to have a conversation on who really owns Nigeria as of today. So that's, that's, that's the way I look at it. That's why I approach it from, from the, 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 because it's an ideological thing. It's a mindset thing. We don't think that the youths own the country. We believe that they are our voice. That is why they are only useful when it comes to the times of politics, oh, okay? And we just, we just treat them, we don't treat them as partners. We don't treat them as, as people that have anything to offer. We treat them as our houseboys, our servants, our beggars, that all you need to do is just go around, throw peanuts at them, and that is it. All right, Look Mr. at Yartu. our budget. What is the government position and ideological stance about the future of Nigeria and the youth? Look at the budget. All right, Mr. Yartu, let's move away from that now, but uh, still staying with uh, the Daily Sun a newspaper this morning. Lagos and Oshun please read Riot Act. Should the police read the Riot Act? I mean, against uh, the planned protest. It's about the very same thing. Approach and strategy. As long as somebody is an irritant, what you do is you crush the person. But when the person is a strategic partner, what you do is you dialogue with the person. As far as our people are concerned, the youth are irritant. But as far as our people are concerned, the youth are irritant. So they really, they are just upset. That's why they go out to crush. But when you know that these people, that's why I like the statement of the Lagos State Governor, who says that, the youth have a reason to demand a better future. That is just a mindset that makes you to sit down and engage them and dialogue with them. The youth have a reason. Anybody above 50, 55, November 1, in a few days, I'll be 58. So I'm not trying to talk to include myself. Anybody above 55 should know that they are sitting on there. The least they can do is to start to interface. That's why I talk in terms of responsibility transfer to the youth. That's where our mindset should be. We cannot just say, okay, come and carry, take. No. But we must begin the process of responsibility transfer. And it's going to be gradual. That's why the youth, I also tell the youth, don't want to rush to take. You know, it's something that is not in your hands. You need to be strategic. 
right. you need to be extremely careful in the way you get about it. But let us that believe that we have all, you know, set for us, know that the youth is their time. All right, Mr. Ayatok, let's move on and talk about security now. Um, it's on the punch this morning. It says, El Rufai hails troops as uh, 50 bandits are killed in air and uh, ground operations. Share your thoughts on that. And, uh, of course, uh, with regards to our, you know, efforts concerning you know, wiping you know, out Yeah, security. yeah. This, this, um, this insecurity problem is being attacked from a wrong perspective, I say it again. The day we sit down to think and interrogate, why do we have insecurity? I think that's a wise thing to do. Why is there insecurity? Where is the wind on their sail? Where is the oxygen that fans that their flames? Where is it? Where do they recruit people from? What emboldens them? The day we sit down to have honest conversation on these questions will solve Nigeria's security problem. But we have contractors in power. They would rather budget billions and billions to buy Tucano jets instead of deploying that amount of money to develop the youths who are their wind the youth are their oxygen in their flame. They are the wind in their sail. Imagine you devoting the cost of one Tucano jet to reintegrating, developing the youth of the Northeast. Please tell me one government program as at today to develop the youth of the Northeast. Tell me that grand plan where you even bring up hope to them this is coming, and you can paint the picture of a better future. Tell me who in government is painting the picture of a better future to any of the youth in the Northeast. These are the wind in their sail. These are the oxygen in their fen. And you want to stop them. You don't want to stop them. You want to make money. You want defense budget to be this high, an education budget to be nothing but this. The question is, where is the future of Nigeria? These guys know what they are doing. They know that they have a little time left, so they just want to enjoy their lives and then exit. I don't care about this country. That is my very honest opinion. The day they do, they will sit down and have honest conversation on education. Okay. And I'm not talking of youth empowerment again. That's absolute rubbish. I'm talking youth development. Where you are a journalist, please tell me that government program, that government body that is bringing hope to the young people that they can have a better future. Everybody knows that the future is ICT. What is going on? The police is clamping down on any young man that has a laptop and a, a, a backpack on his back with a laptop. Because they don't understand the future. They don't understand the youth. They live in an alternative world. And the youths don't belong there. Who is that government policy that says every young Nigerian in tertiary institution must have a laptop? Who is creating that ICT world for them and then creating the ecosystem that isolates the bad one? No. Instead, they want to stigmatize the Nigerian youths. Are into, they show us how the, the EFCC has gone and gotten all these um, Yahoo boys, Yahoo boys, painting, they know what they are doing, painting a picture that the young people are involved in yaw yaw. But young Nigerians are involved in ICT. They are developing programs. They are getting into the blockchain technology. This is the way of the future. Please tell me who in government is making a statement that says, the youth, this is the way you are going. That's the way it should be. Government is coming on hard on you to make sure that they support you and give you all the necessary infrastructure. They, who is doing that? Who is talking about subsidizing data? But they are subsidizing petrol. And how many young people have anything to do with petrol? We're just having a government that just think of themselves and themselves and themselves. And we're we are getting so, so much into risk because our young people have been abandoned. And because they are abandoned, they are fending for their lives, sometimes in the wrong way, and they are getting wrong mentors to tell them the way to go. This thing is hope.
is all about mindset, mindset. And these people in government are not thinking that way. That's why I hope that we will listen to Professor Jega and we that call ourselves these elites, enlightened people, will start. I think it's, it's a topic, I don't know if you'll get to that about Professor Jega and his statement, because I listened to him with rapt attention. Okay. Uh, let's quickly talk about um, uh, vaccination. What do you make of the compulsory vaccination, COVID-19 vaccination in Kaduna State for civil servants? I, That's on the Daily Independent. I know. I will wish to pass. The reason is that at my level, my statements should be guarded. And where I have some levels of reservation, I should be careful not to pass a wrong message. Um, there's issues of faith on, 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 on the, one of the most controversial things I've seen in my whole life is this issue of this COVID-19. I don't know what to think again, but all the same, I believe that every responsible government must look at global trends and in their considered opinion, they think it's important that um, people should get vaccinated. I think it is important. And, um, but to the extent of um, making it compulsory, I do not know how that works. But like I said, I am a public commentator and I'm supposed to be a nation builder. So I should not be any person or somebody that will make statements that would be um, emboldening what the, the state or the country is trying to encourage. So I will oh. encourage everybody to abide by the protocols. And then if a government takes a decision, I think that every citizen should weigh that decision. And then government should also weigh the decisions they make and make sure that they do not... Um, please permit me to pass. All right, all right, Ms. Antok, let, let's move to the Southeast. Uh, it says on the Daily Sun, tension in Southeast over Kano's trial tomorrow. Masob warns federal government flays heavy military presence in the region. Um, there's also, I believe, a sit-at-home um, order for the Southeast tomorrow by the IPOB in respect of the trial. And, of course, I think I also saw yesterday that, uh, I'm not sure who it was, and, you know, asking that the federal government should not fail to produce an uh, Kanu in court. It's all this. If we have people who think proactively, it's a very simple thing. People want to see Kano. That's number one. Number two, government is afraid that maybe if they bring him out, something untoward could be done. What is the midway? It's so simple. Government calls for a different program that people don't know, you know, correspondence. And then you get into the program and discover that while people are waiting there and making noise, people are showing you live, kind of being tried. They don't know the location, but the journalists are there. It's being done transparently. It's being done free and fair. So you can't say Kanu was not brought. Kanu was brought. Do you understand me? It's being tried. They are allowing the journalists to have a live feed of the proceedings you just don't know where. So, you want to see Kanu, you have seen Kanu. You want him to be tried openly and transparently. You can see the process that the government have nothing to hide if they actually have nothing to hide. If you so do this, brother, what is so difficult in this? You've just asked me this question now. I probably didn't think about it, but the answer just pops up and any reasonable person will say, okay, that makes sense. What's so difficult? But you see, you have government that is just bent on being confrontational. Confrontational. We'll stamp you out. We'll deal with you. This is not military era, for God's sake. This is democracy. And one of the things about democracy is that the power belongs to the people. They call you and they ask for something, and you've got to give it to them. So I don't think that, you see, our governments need to have strategic thinkers that work with them. And, and it's so easy. But we're going to make this to become, even by today, just let it, somebody can just leak the secret. Kano is going to be brought and there's something. You understand? You can change the narrative. You can seize the conversation. But we don't. 
Okay, quickly, so, um, so we can wrap up, quickly share your thoughts on a uh, statement by um, former NEC chair, uh, Atahiro Jaga. Uh, it's on the Daily Sun. It says, 2023, Jaga predicts uh, doom for APC and PDP. Says parties would soon implode once against direct primaries. We can wrap up with My that. Brother, I, want, I want to ask you, what is so difficult? Who amongst you people sincerely believe that APC, PDP have anything to offer? Who sincerely believes that? These are enterprises, by my own opinion. These are business people who have put in so much money. They've sold their houses. Some of them have mortgaged their conscience to be able to get into power. To them, it's a game of power. But over 70% of Nigerians know that governance is a very serious business that you need the brightest and the best to navigate to handle. But you see, we are all sitting back and complacent and complaining and whining while the, the, the politicians are putting their money where their mouth is and they are smiling all the way to the bank. Jega says that a time has come when every man or woman of conscience should stop and step into politics. Don't tell me your, my vote will not count. What they will do is what they will do. That's the narrative they want you to drive. Seventy percent of us. You can see. I have. I have. I have. Um, I joined the party, ADC African Democratic Congress. I've joined the party, and I am saying every Nigerian join a party. If you want to go into APC PDP, no problem. Join them. Let's see what they can do. If not, so come to where we have a change. Come to where we have a system where we have a progress and be at the beginning and set the rules so that we can save this nation. We can't continue with just looking at APC, PDP as if we are hopeless, as if we are helpless. We are not helpless. We just decide not to do what we should do. I have decided, I and my household, we've decided to come into this Nigeria project. And I want to challenge every Nigerian. Come in, join the National Consultative Front, join the new order. And if I may even be specific, join ADC, Mohanu has just joined. Let us create a new paradigm, a new platform, and together we will be able to rescue Nigeria. I want to help Professor Jega for that very bold step. And people are coming out. Don't just sit and wait. We can be the change that we want to be. We are more than them. We can do it, I believe. Ezekiel Yanai Talk, thank you so much for your analysis and these stories making headlines and um, always, of course, for joining us. We wish you a very Thank you. beautiful Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. All right. Um, that's all for Off the Press. Let's take a little bit of history uh, just before we go on a short break. And we're going back to, of course, uh, something that we've spoken a lot about this morning. It is the 20th of October, 2020, uh, just a year ago, uh, where um, some of the very, very saddest events that have occurred in Nigeria in a very long time. Uh, some people have said that um, something died in them on the 20th of October, uh, 2020, one year ago. It was on this night that the uh, largest gathering, of course, at, of protesters at the Lekki Toll Gate was eventually, you know, allegedly, well, well I, I, no longer allegedly, but uh, fired at by soldiers of the Nigerian army. At about uh, 6.50 p.m., members of the army opened fire on the peaceful protesters um, at the Lekki Toll Gate in Lagos. Um, the government had, sometime around 4 p.m., imposed a nationwide lockdown from 4 p.m., uh, which had earlier been announced uh, sometime at just around 1 o'clock in the afternoon. According to Amnesty International, shortly before the shooting, CCTV cameras were allegedly removed from the toll gate. Um, the Lagos State government subsequently said that there were laser cameras and not CCTV cameras, as earlier published on social media. 6.29 p.m. in Lagos, two military vehicles were filmed leaving Bonnie Camp in Lagos, shared on social media. Nigerian DJ Switch made a live stream, and I'm sure that thousands, and maybe not just thousands, millions of people um, got to watch that live stream of the shooting on her Instagram account. According to one of the witnesses, after the lights went out, the soldiers arrived and allegedly began shooting directly at the crowd. Another witness stated that the shooting continued for 15 to 30 minutes, and that after the shooting, he observed multiple bodies on the ground. Protesters had earlier sat and locked arms singing the Nigerian anthem and waving the Nigerian flag. And, of course, reports say, you know, um, at least 46 people were killed in the, you know, build-up to that day and, of course, you know, also um, on that day. 
uh, till date, the Nigerian government has refused, I, I believe, or failed to uh, show complete accountability for the events of the 20th of October in 2020. And the judicial panel of inquiry that was set up has not been able to actually provide any form of justice, um, uh, well, you know, to those victims or to as many of the victims as possible. We've heard every now and then of uh, some level of compensation, financial compensation to victims in other uh, states. Um, but it's, it's a really, really sad, really, really sad um, story to share um, uh, in history today. Good thing is after the short break, we're going to be speaking with um, um, additional Gunlano, who's a lead counsel to the end SARS protesters. And uh, he'll be joining us to share his views on how far we've come and, of course, uh, updates on the panel sitting. Stay with us. <laughs>